from a very basic desire of the, uh, especially of the Air Force, of the US Air Force, to integrate fallible humans in like training systems, in pro training programs, to try and overcome the fallibility of humans. Uh, the idea from the beginning, before ARPANET and all of that, was to figure out ways of making machine, man-machine systems, as they were then called, man-machine systems in which were integrated with the human as the secondary facilitating element. So I think one long term, I think one of the things that's got us to where we are now is this long term attempt, which has now been achieved, I would argue, if you read like Shoshana Zuboff's book of many things now, of the things that people are writing now, that show that um, your individual uh, screen user, especially if they are children, which is one of the, the big focus in my book, uh, are very close now to be, uh, becoming um, automatable elements in a kind of closed uh, cybernetic system through the screen. So I think we could trace this up. In, it, the trajectory from this seems to me to come from right after the, uh, the, uh, the middle part of the century when it was the, when the, mili the military kind of dynamic was to just integrate humans into machine human systems. In, and, and that starts in a kind of clumsy way. But by the time we get to the 60s and the whole cybernetic era, and uh, or, or I think cybernetics comes earlier, but ARPANET and, and all of that, there's already a, a quite a long track record and trial and error process of trying to set up cybernetic human machine interfaces in which uh, the human becomes as uh, automatable and predictable and manageable as the machinery. So this seems to me to be an important kind of uh, older, deeper context for what's, what seems to have happened. And what seems to have happened is, uh, I mean, it's clear, it's clear that uh, why wouldn't, why wouldn't uh, the, the military or other kind of state elements want to have enhanced, um, super kind of detailed um, surveillance of citizens? It goes way back. I mean, Michel Foucault, who I'm not a great fan of, but still, uh, he writes about how the uh, early in an earlier period, from the eighteen uh, from the eighteen hundreds on, states start to expand bureaucracies and run kind of more modern or modern looking societies. And for that, you need data and information on citizens. You can't even run a basic thing like a, a, you know, a basic social social institutions in modern settings unless you have maximal or increasingly reliable and, and kind of expanding information on citizens. So I take the surveillance uh, kind of, of citizens to be a basic sort of imperative of states or states associated actors. And then uh, the best thing I read about all of that was uh, Yasha Levin's book, uh, Surveillance Valley, where he lays it out nice, nice and clear. The um, setting up of ARPANET, <clears throat> the kind of simul more or less simul simultaneous uh, uprisings around the world in the kind of post or anti-colonial movements, the beginnings of something that looks like, looks like a lot of revolutionary uh, activity at home in the, in the 60s, including, you know, the quite some actually, some rhetorically dangerous groups, but also some actually dangerous. You, you've, got, you've got Bill Ayers and all of that. You've got people wanting to start to throw bombs around. So, uh, it would make sense to me just that uh, that technology would then be used to to uh, to do that. And then the real classic example, I think, is that one of LifeLog, you know, the LifeLog story. So that all happens. Uh, it, it, that seems to have been a kind of key moment where everything becomes clear, in a sense. You can see that uh, there are powerful agencies wanting to set up a system whereby people will surveil themselves. Uh, Put data about what they've been eating, who they know, where they've been going, what they're thinking voluntarily into a kind of a very early version of the internet, earlier, kind of the earlier version of the internet. And um, they're doing all that under the LifeLog project, aren't they? And then they close the LifeLog project. And then, like a week later, or within even less than a week, I mean, uh, a guy called Zuckerberg turns up with, with a thing called Facebook. So, what you can see there, I think, is the real tribe and trusted system, and it's a smart system whereby the authorities seed fund or uh, identify promising young innovators, fund them, wait for the good stuff to come, and then kind of – that's the cycle, isn't it? I think it's a fairly clear cycle. That So the, the Facebook and the rest of them then look like, look like very 
logical outcomes of this uh, experimental use uh, of the, the state actors go where the energy is, where the innovation is, pay for it to develop, and then reap the benefits. Uh, in, in that cycle, you can see LifeLog leading into Facebook and everything has happened since, I think fairly clearly. I think it seems like a fairly clear uh, line of development. 